Branson, Missouri. Thank you for your prayers. I'd also solicit your prayers uh, for the uh, fire uh, fellowship. Uh, it's a regional one. It's in Moore Park, uh, California, in the uh, L.A. area. I'm one of the speakers, and we'll be speaking the first thing Tuesday morning, a week from this Tuesday in Moore Park, California. Uh, the theme of the conference is on the Psalms, and I've chosen to address one of the wisdom psalms. There are three of them in this in the Psalter. And so I'll be speaking on the on Psalm number one. So pray for me as I uh, drive to the conference and then drive home. I just pray that God would bless. There's a, there's been all kinds of hesitations and ifs and ands and buts and so forth about having the conference, but they went ahead and had it and they're gonna it's going to be virtually uh, uh, broadcast, so if you're free and want to, you can watch it on your on your uh, computer. I'll have to figure out what the uh, site is for the. It'll be Grace Bible Church in Moore Park, uh, California. So I suspect they'll have some live feed off off that internet site. So. You may want to watch it. It starts Monday night and then goes all a day, all day on Tuesday, and then it closes Tuesday evening. And hopefully, I'll be able to make it back okay on Wednesday. Plan to be here, there, uh, here Wednesday night for our, our prayer service, God willing. Take your Bibles now and open to Philippians chapter 3. I want to look at some themes that relate to the coming of the Lord. One of the things it says in the Old Testament about men whom David trusted from the tribe of Issachar, uh, there were men who understood the times in which they lived. And I believe if ever there were a time for the church of Jesus Christ <clears throat> to be understanding what's happening in our country, what's happening even on a global scale, but you see, one of the things that has to happen if the book of Revelation is to be understood literally, and I do, along with its figures of speech, its symbolism, I understand it literally that there's a time in the future wherein God is going to be dealing with the nation of Israel in particular and the nations in general, and he will judge this earth on which we live. And everything is heading up to a global level. It is global in nature. We live in a time unique from the Apostle Paul in that he probably did not understand, even know some of the nations of the world. Neither did Old Testament prophets and scholars who wrote I say scholars because there were some men. Moses was a scholar. He was trained in Egypt. David was a Torah scholar. It is believed by the rabbis. Isaiah was a scholar. And that is, uh, he was very knowledgeable, very articulate, very uh, well written. And these men did not understand the global circumstances of the earth. They didn't understand South America, North America, Australia, uh, the Chinese, Soviet Union as we used to know it, Russia, Southeast Asia, all of these areas of the world, uh, they didn't see that, but they anticipated it in some of their prophecies. You say, what do you mean? One of them deals with a 200 million man army. Well, now we understand that there is a country who can man, both India and China could man a 200 million man army and fulfill a prophecy that's outlined in the book of Revelation. So we're living in global times, global times, and we need to understand the times, not live in our little shells, so to speak. And I think that's one of the purposes behind me trying to teach on this subject to stimulate 
our understanding of the times in which we live. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, uh, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it might be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. May God bless the reading of this text of Scripture. Join me in prayer. Father, as we examine the Word of God, I pray that the Spirit of God would activate it to our hearts. Father, in my preaching, I realize it's an exercise that is futile if it's done in the flesh. May the Spirit who was given on the day of Pentecost to the church, the Spirit who filled these early apostles and preachers as they preached, I think of Peter on the day of Pentecost. I think of Philip as he went to Samaria. I think of the Apostle Paul as he went into Asia Minor. And the Spirit of God filled these men as they proclaimed the Word of God. Oh, our Father, may we all be under the control of the Spirit of God, walking in the Spirit, being filled with the Spirit of God, realizing that our sanctification is dependent upon God working in us to will and to do of His good pleasure. Use your Word now, Holy Spirit of God, activate it to our hearts as the living and powerful Word of God. Unlike anything that man has ever written, these books that we have, have the force of power behind them, the force of the promise of God and the blessing of God to all who heed its content. So bless us to that end, and we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We live in perilous times, and there are those who would fear what may, may be on the horizon. They're not only perilous times, but I believe they're apocalyptic times. John F. Kennedy was known during his presidential campaign to often close his speeches with a story about Colonel Davenport. He was the Speaker of the House of Representatives in the state of Connecticut, or the colony at the time. One day in 1789, the sky of Hartford, Connecticut was darkened ominously. And some of the representatives glancing out the window feared the end was at hand. Quelling a clamor for immediate adjournment, Davenport rose and said, The day of judgment is either approaching or it is not. If it is not, there's no cause for adjournment. If it is, I choose to be found doing my duty. Therefore, I wish that candles be brought in. These are ominous times. And for the unbeliever, they do cause anxiety. They do cause fear. But for the believer who understands the times, understands that God has an ultimate purpose for the ages. This earth that we live on is temporary. There is going to be a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. This earth as we know it is going to be burned and renovated. And there will be a new heaven and a new earth. So rather than fearing what's going to come, we as believers need to be faithful doing what Christ wants us to do till He returns. Don't fear the dark. We don't have to fear the dark because we are lights. I'm talking about spiritual darkness, not physical darkness. Darkness is descending upon the earth. And the day star is going to dawn at some point. I think more and more 
about the coming of the Lord. I guess because of circumstances in our world today, but also because I'm getting closer to the end of my life. I think about seeing Christ. I don't know if you think about that. But every person in this auditorium will appear before Christ. Every knee shall bow. And every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You're going to bend the knee someday before Christ. Those of us who have believed, maybe not physically, but in a spiritual sense, have bowed before the risen and exalted Christ who is on His throne and trusted Him as our only hope, our Savior and our Lord. And so consequently, it gives us a different perspective on life. It gives us a different world view. We filter things through the Word of God. Which means that you have to be familiar with this book to understand the times. You can't be delinquent in understanding the Word. You know, that text that we read in our Scripture reading, it it just leaped off the page to me as we were reading it. I'd never seen that word in that context before, but it was it was a blessing. That last bold print said, We know that the Son of God is come and hath given us an understanding. That's the same word that was used by Jesus in the parable of the sower and seed, the last soil was those who understood what was being said. Soil number one didn't understand. Soil number two didn't understand. Soil number three, it doesn't say by the words of our Lord that they understood, but soil number four, they understood. And this text tells us that He has given us understanding that we may know Him that is true. So, coming to faith in Jesus Christ is predicated on Him giving us faith and giving us repentance and giving us understanding. These are gifts of God so that we can come to faith freely. It's not based on your understanding. The Scripture says, lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge Him. You see, that's how the world tries to process the Gospel. They try to filter it through their own understanding. And you're not going to understand it by human reasoning. It can only be understood as the Spirit of God opens your ears and opens your eyes. I realized that more and more. I was in correspondence with Mike Taranzoni and telling him circumstances that we were having at church. And I, I said, I'm coming more and more to the conclusion that when I, well, let me put it this way, I get frustrated in presenting the truth as I know it in clarity. And I try to make it as simplistic and clear as possible what the gospel is. And I present it, and they don't get it. And they won't get it unless God grants them understanding. So your world view is predicated on the idea that initially in your conversion that God has given you understanding so that now you can understand the things of the Lord. And you need to devote yourself to understanding. If you understand it, you scratch your head, that doesn't make sense to you, you better pray. Open my eyes that I may see wondrous things out of your law. God, give me understanding. I prayed that before when I come to a Scripture. I prayed that just sitting here. I said, Lord, when I get in this pulpit, help me 
sometimes while I'm preaching, I know, I know that I'm not getting anywhere. And I'll utter a, a, a little prayer in my mind. Lord, help me. Help me. Help me right now. So I hope he's helped me and will help me through this text and help you to understand, not be afraid. He speaks here of the believer's citizenship. The believer's citizenship. Interesting, when we were dealing with the subject of the language of salvation, one of the themes of salvation is that our citizenship has been established in heaven as part of the salvation package. Here, now, right now, you're a citizen in heaven. It's interesting. One of my professors, he was with my advisor during seminary days, Robert Leitner, who's with the Lord now. He writes, the people of Philippi were living a, there as colonists while their citizenship was in Rome. Every resident of Philippi, and that was not the case necessarily throughout the Roman Empire. As they conquered people, they were not necessarily citizens, but everybody in Philippi was a citizen of Rome, even though they didn't reside there. One writer said, the citizens of Philippi were automatically citizens of Rome, sharing all the rights and privileges of Roman citizens, even though most of them had never been there. Not everyone who lived in Philippi was a full citizen of Philippi, but the citizenship held by much of the church, especially owners of homes in which it met, would raise the status of the whole movement there. Paul's readers in Philippi therefore understood quite well that it, what it means to be citizens of the supreme city, Rome, while not yet living there. That's the circumstance that it is with us. We're not living in heaven, but the Bible assures us that we have citizenship in heaven. As a matter of fact, Paul said we're seated in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. We are as assured of heaven as we are assured of our salvation here on earth. You don't carry a document of citizenship other than your conversion. Your conversion is your documentation. Have you believed in Jesus for salvation? You're a citizen of Arizona, citizen of the United States. Aren't you thankful this morning that when you die, you're translated? I don't know where, ever, how they came up with this doctrine of soul sleep, the Adventists, but that's their, their doctrine. When, in their theology, a person dies, they go into a sort of an unconscious, suspended state of sleep until the, the resurrection. In other words, you don't know anybody, don't know anything that's going on. You're just kind of in amnesia. But that's predicated on some Old Testament texts that they use and try to support it from the New Testament. During the 19th century in the United States, there was a movement that took place during that time called the Restoration Movement, and a lot of cults and isms were born and propagated out of that time. One of them was Seventh-day Adventism. Another one was Church of Christ. That's part of the Restoration Movement. Another one was Jehovah's Witnesses. That came out of that. Mormonism came out of that. It was supposed to be a restoration movement, taking the people of God back to a clear understanding of what they believe was the New Testament. Christianity. In 
And uh, so a lot of these false doctrines, something, somehow people think they can come up with something better. They have a new insight, a new take on something, something that, that uh, great men of God previous to them, they've all missed. Uh, in reality, they've not missed it. But our citizenship is in heaven. That's where we are primary citizens. We had to produce documentation on our trip back to, as you do, if you go on airlines, you check in at the counter. They want to see your ID. So we show them a passport. A passport. That's what I use instead of a driver's, driver's license anymore because I don't have the new no new license yet. Mine hasn't expired. My old one. I'm cantankerous when it comes to that stuff. But I do have a passport that's current. So I use that. I use that ID to prove my citizenship, my residence, who I am, where I belong. They accept that. So that's your primary citizenship. As a matter of fact, the scriptures refer to us as pilgrims and strangers here on earth. In the book of Hebrews, I invite your attention there. The book of Hebrews chapter 11. Verses 13 and following. Hebrews chapter 11. Now this, this is in an Old Testament context. This was the saints back then. These, and that is those that have been mentioned up to this point, which include Abraham, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, these all died in faith. In other words, the faith that they had expressed toward the Lord God of heaven and his saving relationship with him as they understood it by revelation, they remained, they persevered in that faith. Not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them embraced them, and confessed, here's the phrase, they were strangers and pilgrims on earth as we are. Peter, writing to the Christians in Asia Minor, says and calls them elect strangers and pilgrims. They're chosen. We're here sojourning. Let's not let our roots get too deep. Let's not become attached to this world. You realize how attached you are to this world when you have to go through and inventory your possessions and get rid of them. Or your family has to get rid of them when you die. I didn't realize all that junk. For those who say such things, what things? That they're strangers and pilgrims. That's what they confess. Declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had been called, or they called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. For he has prepared a city for them. He has prepared for us a city. And that is where the place of your citizenship is. Note what it says. For our citizenship is in heaven. In heaven. John Hess Yoder, 
he wrote an article in Leadership Magazine. He's from Portland, Oregon. He served as a missionary in Laos, and he discovered while there an interesting illustration of the kingdom of God. Before colonists imposed national boundaries, the kings of Laos and Vietnam reached an agreement on taxation in their borders. Those who ate short grain rice built their houses on stilts and decorated them with Indian style serpents and were called Laotians. On the other hand, those who ate long grain rice and built their houses on the ground and decorated them with Chinese style dragons were considered Vietnamese. The exact location of a person's home was not what determined his or her nationality. In other words, they might be intermingling or closely uh, by them, by distance. So it wasn't the exact location of one's home that didn't determine a nationality. Instead, each person belonged to the kingdom whose cultural values he or she exhibited. And then he makes this application. He says, so it is with us. We live in the world. But we're different from the world. Our culture is heavenly in orient orienta orientation. Our hope is in heaven. We think about heaven. That's the progress. That's the goal for which we move is heaven. We live according to the standards of heaven, the kingdom, and its values. So our place of citizenship is in heaven. So he deals with his citizenship, our citizenship. The believer's expectation is what he addresses in verse 20, the latter part of it. From which... From which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Which here is a pronoun referring back to heaven. We are so focused on heaven and we know the promise of his return. We live in anticipation of that return. Just recently one of our grandsons had a birthday and Paulette, bought him. I think it was a gun, wasn't it, of some sort? Ordered it through Amazon Joshua. And he, he, he couldn't wait. Uh, somehow the, it was delayed in his shipment because of COVID and that type of thing. And so consequently, he'd be watching when the UPS truck would drive by, hoping that it would come into their driveway and it would have his gift. I don't know how delayed he got it, but he was eagerly waiting and anticipating that gift. I remember as kids growing up, one of the big deals was Christmas time. Christmas time. We weren't rich by any measure, but our parents made it a point to celebrate the holiday and buy gifts for us. And we couldn't wait for Christmas morning. Because they would hide the gifts. I found out where they hid them one time. My mother and father had a dresser, and underneath the dresser was a hollow place. Somehow I pulled that dresser back, and I saw those presents under there. Now, I can't remember whether I peeked or not, but I knew where they were. But we always anticipated that time anticipated it as a child with eagerness to be able to see exactly what our parents bought. Usually they'd ask us what we wanted and they would try to buy what we wanted. Any, anymore, it's not that way. We celebrate Christmas all different times around that season. Nonetheless, it is an expectation that people have and they eagerly wait for it. 
some people when they are married they can't wait to tie the knot to seal the bond that brings them together they've been waiting maybe weeks days months even they're engaged and they enter into that union they can't wait for that day that's that's the christian's attitude toward heaven i can't wait until I see my Savior. There, there's all kinds of arguments as to how old this earth is. We know it's at least 6,000, maybe 10,000 years old. But it is not an old earth. It is not a specimen of evolution. I believe in a young universe. But the whole creation groans in expectation. There are other passages in Scripture that use this very word, eagerly expect. Uh, one writer said that this word suggests a tiptoe anticipation and longing. Look at Romans chapter 8 where we see it used repeatedly in three verses. Romans, the eighth chapter, verse 19 is the first verse. Let me pick up the context in verse 18. For I consider that the suffering of this present time is not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation, and here's our word, eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. And that would be a catchphrase for when the sons of God are revealed and manifest at the rapture. And then we read further down in this text, in verse 23, not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves. Not only is there a groaning and an anticipation in creation for a restoration, but we who have received now the evidence of a great harvest to come, which is seen and experienced in the first fruits, which is the Spirit. We groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our bodies, which would be the same as, for all intents and purposes, as the revealing of the sons of God. Now again, there's another text, verse 25. But if we hope for what we do not see, and that's heaven, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Same as the Old Testament saints. They waited with eager anticipation. There's something wrong as a believer if you don't have that expectation of glory. I mean that. I don't, not that you think about it 24 hours a day, but at least you think about it. This is not my final home. As this, this a songwriter said, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open doors. And I cannot feel at home in this world anymore. This isn't it. It's all passing. We don't know what will happen November 3rd. But it doesn't change this one bit. Doesn't change this one bit. Matter of fact, it may accelerate it. <laughs> it may be here before you know it. 
This is our expectation, our earnest expectation. The writer of Hebrews uses it. There are two other places, but I'll just look at it. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28. The book of Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28. Let me pick up the context in verse 27. And as it is appointed for men to die once. But after this, the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many to those who eagerly wait for him. There's our phrase. He will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation, and that is ultimate deliverance, which would be glorification. That's part of the package of salvation. Glorification. Finally, let's look at the believer's transformation. Verse 21. Verse 21, when that happens, there's going to be uh, a, the magnitude of the miracle that takes place is not only taking us into heaven, but in that moment, in the translation of believers at the rapture from earth to glory, something is going to happen so quickly in a twinkling of an eye that uh, will hardly realize it's happening you know some of the people that Jesus healed it was instantaneous sometimes it was a process each one was not the same but with a believer and going to glory it's going to happen super quick who will transform our lowly body, our body of humiliation. Some translations put it vile bodies. Our lowly bodies. The bodies that are subjected to sin, disease, and decay. Aches and pains. Any more. <laughs> I see more remedies out there for people's aches and pains than you can shake a stick at. Every time I turn around, on Facebook, somebody's advertising this to take care of this and advertising that to take care of that. And they all uh, are, are convinced it's the miracle product. The only miracle product <laughs> that you can be assured of as a believer is this one. It'll happen so quickly. I'll have hair on my head again. Well, I had a knee, knee removed. I don't know how that's going to work. How, in a moment, it's going to be taken out there and put back in place. A brand new knee. New teeth. All of it. Transformed. Transformed. Our lowly bodies. Our bodies which are subject. And those who have been in the grave. Their bodies. The flesh and the sinew. It's all decayed. A skeleton may remain. And even those who have been, who, who have died and, and ha had a funeral at sea and their bodies were put over the, the side of the boat and no doubt sharks and other fish ate, ate those bodies. All of that's going to come back together. You say, oh, how's that? I don't know. I confess I don't know. I don't know how all of the molecules, atoms, and everything that comprises a human being is going to be brought back together. But the God who brought Jesus back from the dead is able to do all of that. Able to do all of what He promised to do. Transform that it may be conformed. So you have the transformation and the purpose of it is conformity. Conformity to
to Christ's glorious body, his body. According, and here's the key, to the, according to the working by which he is able, so two words of significance, the working there, the energy by which he is able, that is, he, pos he possesses a, the ability. Some things we're unable to do. One of those things you're unable to do is to come to Christ. You don't have the ability to do that as a lost human being. It is Christ coming to you because he has the ability to change a heart of stone into a heart of flesh. He has the ability to bring new life to you through the quickening power of God and the new birth He can bring and transform an individual. He has that ability. Jesus said, except a man be born again, he cannot. That word can denotes ability. The not along with it denotes universal inability. Unless you're born again, you cannot. You don't have the ability. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of spirit is spirit. It is only God who has that ability. And what is that ability? The ability to subdue all things to himself. All of this earth that is in rebellion to him. And everything that sin has contaminated in this universe, he is able to bring it all back into order again. He's able to transform it. It's not going to take years and years and years like the building of this wall on our southern border or some projects that people build towers, high skyscrapers, takes them years in planning and then execution. Jesus, when he comes back, is able to subdue all things to himself by his own power and ability. And with that, he is able to transform our body of humiliation. It is divine power at work. That's why more and more as I witness, I, I realize that as I witness this somebody, it's going to take the power of God to change their heart. I can't do it. And I'm tired of trying to do it that way by human methods. Pray a prayer of faith. Pray the sinner's prayer. Come down an aisle. Sign a card. What are you trusting in? God's ability to save or in your ability to manipulate? I've seen too much of that manipulation through my ministry and by various and sundry preachers. I have a quote on the board back there by A.W. Tozier. God's purpose is not for us to fill churches. God's purpose is to fill people with God. The believer's transformation. And in other passages of Scripture, he outlines that. Other writers. John does. Beloved, now are we the children of God. And it, does not yet have, it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Changed. Someone has posed this question, how long does it take to become a Christian? A moment and a lifetime is the answer. In a moment, you're transformed, brought out of darkness into light, brought out of death into life, taken out of bondage into freedom in Christ. It all happens in a moment. And then a process of salvation takes place wherein God through His Spirit and through His Word and through His church and through your own personal and through corporate prayer, God uses these means of grace to transform you into the very image of Christ. And then ultimately, 
God is going to transform you and me into the very likeness of the Son of God himself. So it's a process. It always bothered me when I'd hear in testimony meetings, always people thinking in the past tense, I thank the Lord for saving me. Okay, and I understand that. I thank the Lord for saving me. In 1967, April 2nd, I am indebted deeply to God for saving me. But I'm thankful that it didn't stop, that it's in progress right now, and it will be culminated in glory. It's a process. Do you know that you're being saved? I pray that God will sanctify His truth to you and that you'll become more and more like Christ, His image being formed in you. Are you ready for that time? As I've said before, I don't know. Don't know. If it's a year, day, what? In the future, are you ready for Christ's coming? You know, that's one of the things that God used because I was raised in a Christian church and my, my dad always loved prophecy, loved the coming of the Lord. And that's one thing I feared, that when Christ would come, that I would miss out. And of course, at the time, people told me, as an ignorant kid, said, if you miss the rapture, it's too late which is not true, humanly speaking. And I was always afraid, well, I'm going to miss the rapture. I don't want to miss the rapture. And it was a message that my pastor at South Baptist preached from Matthew chapter 24 on the second coming of Christ. And I forget the outline, forget the content of it, but God impressed upon my heart that Christ was coming again. That was 1967. That's over 50 years ago. Hasn't come since that time. But I look for him to come. I hope I see him in my lifetime. Through the rapture. My question to you is, are you ready? If Christ came today, would you be ready? If you died today, would you be ready? I don't even think about death. We better... Because death is imminent. Just as the rapture is imminent, death is imminent. You're going to die someday. Yeah, well, I'll avoid it. All you have to do is read the obituary columns to realize that death is no respecter of age. Especially in our day and age when child infant mortality Abortion is prevalent in our society where millions of lives are extinguished even before they breathe a breath of air. It's a sad day in which we live. Are you ready? You're only ready if you're in Christ, if you've trusted Him, if you've believed in Christ as your Lord and Savior. You're ready then. I assure you of that. And if God has given you understanding of that, you need to come to Him. And don't delay. Let's close in prayer. Father in heaven, these are perilous times, yet exciting times, for we can see the hand of God in our own lives, in our own history, realizing the promises given to the prophets.